All right, I'm just going to give it a few seconds uh, for everybody to join the webinar. So we'll get started here in about 60 seconds. Okay, we are going to go ahead and get started. So hello everyone and thank you for joining our clinical education webinar today. I'm Stephanie Drum. I am our product manager over our biopsy portfolio here at Argonne. The focus of today's webinar will be the safety and efficacy of 18 gauge full core biopsy instrument specifically for lung biopsies. And today we are honored to have Dr. Robert Bernstein, uh, interventional radiologist from the University of Diagnostic Medical Imaging in Bronx, New York, as well as Dr. Raj Kakarla, uh, interventional radiologist from Mercy Health Hospitals and Clinics in Illinois. So a friendly reminder, we will be recording this session to send out to all registrants at the conclusion of this presentation. Everyone will also be muted during this presentation, and I ask that if you have questions, please place them in the chat box, and we will address them at the conclusion of the presentation. So without further ado, I'm going to pass it over to Dr. Robert Bernstein. Okay, thank you. So uh, we'll be talking, like, like she said, about 18-gauge full-core biopsy instruments for lung biopsies. Uh, is it safe and efficacious, in a word? Yes. Thank you. Any questions? I'm guessing probably the first one is, who am I to make this kind of statement? Um, first, some disclosures. Uh, I am, uh, in theory, a paid speaker for Argonne Medical, although the check has not yet arrived, but we'll see what happens there. Um, also, I do outpatient private practice radiology. I've been doing this since 2006. I average about 100 CT guided biopsies a year. Um, about 20 of those are lung biopsies. Uh, and frankly, uh, this is my favorite needle and biopsy gun. Uh, I love this device. It's great for uh, liver, lung, lymph nodes. You can do lytic bone lesions with this. You can take pieces of adrenal gland, kidneys, pretty much anything that you can see, you can get the biopens and the uh, coaxial inducer into. Um, and when you're doing this in the outpatient setting, you know, we're not a big hospital facility. So you need to kind of run a bit of a tight ship. And the beauty of this is you can have these two devices and cover all the organs you want to biopsy. You don't have to have uh, 50 different types of needles stuck around and, and hidden in your facility somewhere. These two things with the different lengths, it comes in uh, you know, short, medium, and and long, and you can use those for everywhere in the body. The lymph nodes with this true core, I know it's supposed to be long bi biopsy talk, but uh, you can save your patients a trip to the OR because it's it'll, it'll be a big enough piece with the 18 gauge uh, biopens to get you uh, most of the time enough for um, the typing of the lymphoma so they don't have to have the whole lymph node cut out. Um, And then when I was talking with the people at Argonne about this, we went through the data and we looked at, we wrote a paper with them with some of their assistance in terms of statistics and things. Uh, there's the, the reference there, you can link to it. Uh, looking at, um, how do I move this, sorry. Um, uh, full core biopsy device, we looked at 184 patients, uh, analyzing complication rates, procedure success. I did this with my, my PA. Uh, Sorry. Uh, so between February 2009, November 2019, I did 196 lung biopsies here. Uh, we used 184 of them for the data analysis. Uh, the exclusion criteria was simply because we wanted to look at if lesion volume, XYZ axis, was uh, a contributing factor to success, failure, whatnot. Um, so we had to cut out 12. Of course, those 12 that we cut out had no issues, no complications. And it was just 
uh, like PAX upgrades, some files couldn't be up, re-uploaded, pulled back out of archive, or they're just really old and we couldn't reconstruct into 3D to get the volume. So that's why we cut out those 12 for the analysis, but we did those. And uh, what we found, uh, average age of the patient, 70 years plus or minus 11, uh, the average size of the mass, uh, 2.4 by 2.4 by 2.7 centimeters. The smallest we'll go down to in the outpatient setting is maybe about 1.1 centimeters, um, but we can go up to, I mean, I've done as big as, you know, 10 centimeters, baby head size. Um, and the issue with that, and part of the reason why you want to use a full core, and we'll talk about that, and uh, the next speaker will also discuss uh, the benefits of doing the full core, is um, especially nowadays in medicine, it's not about the size of the mass, it's, it's what type of cancer it is, it's what are the hormone and molecular receptors on the surface that really can help guide uh, treatment. And like the lady with the 10 centimeter lung mass, she didn't want to do the biopsy because she was convinced she was done. And I said, look, at least do the biopsy. This way you can make your decision from a position of knowledge, not fear. And it turns out she had all the right receptors on it, all the positivity you needed positive, and she's fine. It's been four years now. She still sends me texts. It's really kind of nice. Um, so in terms of where the masses were of the 184 that we've done, 55% uh, were purely within the parenchyma of the lung. 45% at least had some little attachment to the edge of the lung. Uh, evenly distributed throughout both lungs, although for some strange reason, uh, very few were in the right middle lobe. Maybe somebody else knows why that is, but I, I don't. Um, of those devices, uh, I mean, of those samples, 98.4%, uh, we got tissue, we got diagnosis. It was, uh, and that's what you really want to, you're not, what you really want to be doing is you want to get tissue for diagnosis. And you use this device 98.4% of the time, you're going to get diagnosed examples. Uh, we only had 1.6% that were non-diagnostic. Three of those were just purely necrotic, dead tissue. Uh, one of them, somebody had been treated with radiation. It was fibrosis. Uh, you know, if you're concerned about it, like I said, get a, get a PET CT scan first, especially with some of the larger masses, because uh, as you know, with tumors, they, they don't grow with the appropriate blood supply. So you'll have areas that are starving themselves. And it's not always just the periphery rim of the tumor that's metabolically active. It can be the whole top half of it can be just completely dead and just a small portion of the bottom or the side. And so if you're concerned, get a pet. It can really help guide your needle to get uh, where you want to go. And that's what we wound up doing with uh, the patients that were necrotic. We had them have a pet, so we knew where we were going. And then one of them was just a, it's a straight up mess. It's gonna happen sometimes. Um, I was trying to be fancy and sort of go around along the edge of the mass and then went right along the edge of the mass actually. Um, so it's it, it definitely efficacious. And then in terms of device safety, uh, we had no complications in 77.2%. You know, 78.5 is if you look at all 196. Uh, Minor complications, meaning you know, clinically insignificant pneumothorax, hemothorax. Look, you're you're poking a needle into their lung. You're going to scratch it. You're going to they're going to bleed a little bit. They may you may get a little bit of air leak, but again, it's an outpatient setting. It, if if they go home, if they're fine, if they're pain free, is that really a complication? I I, I don't think so. Um, you know, it's a major complication when you send the patient off to the ER. It, it's uh, that's what I consider a major complication. And with with this device, with this needle in our hands here in the outpatient setting, uh, 2%. You know, we sent three patients to the ER that required chest tubes. Um, they were still breathing just fine. We didn't have, there was no emergency. It's just, it's just, you know, big 30, 40, 50% pneumo off to go, put a chest tube in. And all those patients, they went home either that day, I think, or first thing the next morning. And then there was one patient with severe pain issues. You know, it's an outpatient setting. We don't, we don't have a lot of, um, sedation and things like that to do here. So if they're going to be a pain, you, you, you've got to find ways to work around that. So it's very safe. And you know, this is what I mean by minor complication. I don't know if you can see my little arrow here, but just a, a tiny little air leak because you, you, you poked a needle into their lung. So it's going to leak a little bit of air. And with something like this, patient was fine, breathing just fine. So, you know, they go home. Um, so the way we do it in the outpatient setting here, uh, your basic biopsy tray, uh, real simple, real straightforward. You don't need a lot of stuff. Uh, you've got your chlorhexidine scrub brush, uh, the number 11 scalpel blade, because you've got to make the skin nick. That's really sort of the one drawback with this needle that I find is uh, the tip is not 
super sharp, so it doesn't cut through the skin. You have to make a little skin nick. And as with all things in life, the cut's either too big or too small. Let me try to make it sort of just go in a little bit of the tip of the blade, just enough to get the, the coaxial inducer in without uh, having to force it through the skin. Um, some gauze, some stereo strips, some bandage, uh, towels and chucks are good to have because uh, they are going to spit up blood and you got to warn them about it. If they're awake, you got to warn them, hey, you're going to cough up some blood here. Don't panic. Um, and then, of course, the 17 gauge coaxial inducer and the 18 gauge bio pins. Um, and now, so why use a full core device? Let's be blunt. It gives a nice big piece of meat for the pathologist. Uh, it makes the pathologist happy, makes it easier for them. I mean, it was 20 plus years ago since I did my gross anatomy. And you, you can look at that and I can go, oh, that, that looks kind of like intestine, I think. And yeah, this was metastatic colon to the lung. Um, also, like I was saying, in the era of targeted chemotherapy, right? You, you tell your oncologist, hey, it's a positive for lung cancer. They're going to want to know, well, can you get the KRAS? Can you do the EGFR, the ALK, the ROS1, the PDL1? Um, for a breast primary, they need to know if it's changed its stripes. Does it still have the hormone receptors, the ERP or the HER2? Uh, for your GR, GI, sorry, GI primaries, they're going to want to know the KRAS, the BRAF, the EGFR, the mismatch repairs. They're going to want to know all that. And if you're doing an FNA, uh, there's not enough cells for that. There's not enough tissue for that. The, the, the full core, uh, it sends off to the pathologist. So you can, when you call your referring oncologist, you can say, hey, it's positive lung. The KRAS, the EGFR, it's already cooking. It'll, you'll have those results within a week um, so that by the time they see the patient, they'll know treatment strategy. They'll know what to do. Plus, in the outpatient setting, we don't have a cytologist here. So you want to make sure you're getting enough for them to make the diagnosis. And as you recall from one of the earlier slides, 98% of the time, you get enough for diagnosis by using that full core device. Um, and it's also better for the patient as well, because they don't have to have a second procedure. They don't have to go back and forth. They get the answers for what type of therapy is going to work for them. And that's really what it's all about, is making this uh, easier on the patients to help them through this process. Um, but considerations for doing this in the outpatient setting, because you don't have it, we, we don't have anesthesiologists. Uh, so they're awake and we're talking the whole time. Uh, patient needs to be able to hold the position for 15 to 20 minutes because when you think you can, when you consider positioning them on the table, prepping them, measuring all that things, um, it's going to take about 15, 20 minutes on the CAT scan table. Uh, and do your pre-measurements ahead of time. Think about how you're going to go in, patient prone, supine, don't be afraid to move them around. Also, don't get stuck in one approach. Sometimes you look and there's a rib in the way or there's, when they lay them on their stomach, it flops in such a way that's not going to work. So put them on their side, put an arm up, put an arm down. Sometimes you get ribs that move in the way. Don't get tunnel vision in terms of only one approach. And sometimes that actually takes the longest part of the procedure is figuring out how to orient the patient so you have a nice straight path into the mass. Um, also, uh, respect the limitations of the outpatient setting. If your patient can't stay still, if your patient is hyperventilating, uh, make them go away. Just say, I'm sorry, this isn't going to work here. Um, I know some people, and you read some reports, that like to do breath holding technique. Uh, the problem that I find with that is you tell patients, OK, take a deep breath and hold it. One time it's going to be. <gasps> And then the next time, it's just going to be a little smaller breath because they're not going to be able to do the same type of big breath or little breath each time. And so you're going to have your mass bouncing up and down and moving all over the place. If they can't, if it moves too much with their breathing or you have to rely on breath holding, you're going to have problems. So again, send them off to the hospitals where Dr. Kakala, if I'm pronouncing your name correctly, I hope so. Uh, and people like him can, can do this in a more controlled setting. Um, also respect the limitations of the biopins, right? Uh, the coaxial inducer, it has to be embedded into the mass, especially when you're doing lung biopsies, because the mass itself is going to be uh, a different density than the surrounding lung tissue. And so if you're just right up against the mass, when you fire your gun, it's just going to push it out of the way and you're not going to get results. Um, also, it's got nice gradations of throw, the 1.3, the 2.3, the 3.3 centimeters. Um, if your mass is less than 1.1 centimeter, it's going to be hard to both uh, skewer the tip of your introducer into the mass and uh, get a good throw. 
Um, I'll show you some examples in a minute, but don't be afraid to say, you know what, this shouldn't be done in the hospital setting, or this should, sorry, shouldn't be done in the outpatient setting, do it in the hospital. I know some doctors in the outpatient setting, they worry, oh, you know, if I say that too much, they're not gonna send me patients. Actually, it works the other way around, because I find that when I do that, uh, my referring physicians, they, they realize, hey, I'm not a cowboy here. They respect uh, me a little bit more, and I wind up getting more patients that way. So don't be afraid to say, this isn't appropriate to be done here. Um, and now some examples of what we can do here, right? This is a lady, uh, breast cancer, new lung base mass. Um, so another consideration what you want to do when you're doing the lung biopsies is obviously measure the distance from the skin to the muscle. You want to numb up the path uh, really well with the lidocaine. Uh, you can go all the way to the pleura. And again, make sure you measure well because you don't want to pierce the pleura with the lidocaine. A couple of new ones I've got have actually been from the lidocaine needle, not from the biopins needle, strangely enough. Um, and numbing up the pleura is good because that hurts when you go through. Uh, and if you do all your positioning and all your adjusting uh, in the muscle and the subcutaneous fat and the intercostals, um, you can do all that adjusting beforehand and you're less likely to pop the lung. Uh, and that way you can also then measure the distance from the tip of your needle right into the spot. Uh, you adjust the little, I call it the little paper clippy thing, the, the skin marker. Uh, adjust it to the right depth and then just one, two, three, and bury it to the, to the skin marker and that'll put you in there. If you have to adjust in the lung, uh, you're more likely to pop the lung as well. Um, and again, don't be, I thought this one was going to work perfectly on their side. It kept flopping out of the way. The arm was in the way, the rib was in the way, but we had a really nice approach coming at the angle here. And again, with the, you can actually sh see the shadow that the device casts from the CAT scan machine, and that can be very nice as well, uh, because I, I had the shadow when I was here between the ribs and it let me know, okay, my line is true, my line is perfect, I just, I just need to go another centimeter and a half, two centimeters in, and I'll be in the mass. Uh, again, another known small cell of the lung. Um, another thing to, to think about as well, like I was talking about earlier with the lesion size, right? This is not, the, the 1.4 centimeters was not the axis that we had the approach for. Uh, we avoided the fissures. It was the only way to get to it. Um, you don't have to bury the biopins into the coaxial inducer. Once you take out the, um, the stylet, you can hold it a little bit above the edge. So you only go you know, maybe half a centimeter above so that when you are putting the gun in, it doesn't go all the way through um, and allows you to get tissue for the diagnosis, because that's what this is all about, is getting tissue for diagnosis. Um, I know some people say, oh, don't go to masses that are near, near big airways or big blood vessels. But the beauty of this device and this system as well is you know the throw, you know the distance of the throw, you've got the markers, uh, you've got the skin, the paper clippy thing that I call it, uh, that holds it at the skin level. Um, so like with this patient here, uh, a couple points of this, right? You don't want to poke the airway there, that would be bad. Um, but you can also, you measure the distance on the CAT scan and you know you've got 1.4 centimeters. Okay, great. So I know I'm not going to hit it because it only shoots out 1.3 centimeters, but you have to be a little bit gentle. Uh, brace the needle on the patient's back so that when you go in with the biopins, you're not pushing into the skin because that'll make it go deeper than you want, deeper than the patient wants. Um, and sometimes you don't have an easy straight path. I know some fancy places have got the uh, CT gantries that can tip and give you an oblique. Uh, if you don't have one of those, put a couple of skin markers on, one where you're gonna go in, one where the mass is, and draw the triangle in your brain so that you can, right, this is the straight axial. I'm sorry, you can't see what I'm pointing at, whoops. Uh, this one's the straight axial CAT scan but I could come in from above the rib, go along the top of the rib, and then into the mass here, and that got us our, our sample. Um, and again, uh, right, didn't want to go too deep on this one. It would have been very messy. That's the order there. You obviously don't want to poke that with the biopins, but you know the distance. You can measure the distance. You know the throw. This is another one where you want to make sure that you brace the needle against the patient's back when you're going in with 
the biopens so that you don't go too deep. And you can also, for those of you that have manual transmission cars, uh, treat it a little bit like a stick shift where, I don't know if this is gonna show up on the camera or not, but if you are, uh, with this one here, I pulled down on the hub a little bit to uh, lift the mass up because once you're actually in the mass here, you can move it a little bit. And so I, I, I angled it up to make sure that my throw didn't go anywhere near the aorta. And you can see on the post biopsy, the air bubble in the mass there. So you stay in the mass, you're, you're, you're aware of your depth. Um, and again, it's about uh, being conscious of uh, patient positioning and most of the time, this is what it's gonna look like afterwards. You're gonna see your needle track. You're gonna get a little bit of parenchymal hematoma. They may spit up a little bit of blood with this. Always warn the patients ahead of time because uh, if you don't, they're gonna panic when they see the blood. So warn them, hey, this is the part where you may get a wet tickle in the back of your throat. And just to warn you, it's gonna be bright red blood and they're gonna have a wet cough and then they're gonna spit up bright red blood. Warn them about it and they'll be much more calm. Um, and again, even with two 18 gauge cores, you can get enough tissue for Kelmets adeno and uh, to do all the molecular studies. And that's, that's why you do this, is to make things better for the patients, better for the oncologist. So this one I kind of included partially just to, because it's a really cool case and I, I really enjoyed it. Um, but also another, another technical factor with this, right? This is, this is the jugular vein. You don't want to poke that with the biopins as well, but you can use your anatomic structures, your anatomic landmarks, where if you're looking for your pre-procedure planning, and you go with the measure, you can on your packs just measure and you go, oh, hey, there's a straight line between the mass and the skin that I can draw that doesn't hit bone, that I don't have to go through bone. Um, and if there's a fat plane between where you wanna go uh, and your mass, you can uh, take advantage of that, uh, both with some sort of hydro dissecting with the lidocaine needle, uh, where you can sort of, as you inject with the lidocaine, it'll, the fluid will push things out of the way also, um, you know, use the bone to make sure you don't go too deep. Uh, with this one, uh, I came up to the head of the rib here and then just tapped along the head of the rib until I felt the needle slide underneath it. And then you can also take the stylet and pull it back. So you just have the sleeve uh, and you blunt dissect with that. And that actually works really well both for uh, situations like this and you can also use that in the, in the peritoneal cavity as well. Um, so to summarize a little bit here for outpatient lung biopsies with full core biopsy device, it is safe, right? Uh, with proper technique and appropriate patient selection. Uh, we got 77.2% complication free. If you include all 196, uh, it's 78.5%. Major complications only, you know, two, one and a half, two percent wind up going to the ER. Um, the rest of the stuff, th does it really count? Uh, uh, but one of the keys, like I said, patient selection. Keep your masses greater than 1.5 centimeters if you can. Uh, don't be shy about going, you know what, go F and A at somewhere else, especially if you're doing the outpatient setting. Um, and you're going to get tissue with this device. 98.4% diagnostic samples in our retrospective study. Um, and don't be afraid to ask for the pet to help guide your needle. And then, like I said, it's a versatile system. You can use it throughout the body, not just for the lung. Um, but we're here to talk about lung and it works really well. We're very happy with it and our patients are very happy with it. And I think that now concludes my talk. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> that was a very uh, great intro actually. I think I, I'm glad to have a segue into that after Dr. Bernstein. Um, so, um, I'm uh, Raj Kakarla, I'm the Chair of the Department of Radiology over at Mercy Hospitals here in Illinois in, in Rockford. Um, and um, so, there, here's a few of my disclosures. So, I'm a speaker for Argonne um, and a consultant for P uh, Penumbra and physician proctor um, for Merit Medical. Um, so, um, this actually topic came about as a, you know, uh, area of friendly contention for me and my colleagues. So I'd been in a um, couple of academic practices um, in a hybrid academic and uh, uh, community-based hospital practice in the past, went into private practice and uh, finally settled at Mercy. Um, so a different range of um, practices where, you know, different uh, 
<clears throat> radiologists perform these biopsies. As you know, in private practices, everyone uh, performs biopsies, including our diagnostic colleagues, our body imaging colleagues that are comfortable doing that. Um, so everyone had a uh, different um, you know, comfort, comfort level with either taking cores or uh, the size of the gaze or FNA. So um, this was uh, you know, a friendly contention for a lot of us in terms of who was getting better samples. Um, and I chose to um, actually look into it as a QA uh, in my former practice. And that's how you know, this uh, segue came about in our current practice. Um, so uh, a while back, um, a cross-sectional study was uh, basically performed as a web-based survey uh, for Society of Thoracic Radiology. It was actually sent out to the people that were members of Society of Thoracic Radiology in 2015, and uh, it was interesting, the responses at that time, about um, 240 uh, members um, were surveyed. Um, out of those, uh, you know, a little over half performed lung biopsies, and most of them used CT or CT floral in 2015. Um, and 85% of them uh, performed, at that point, core needle biopsy, or core needle along with FNA, and only 15% performed FNA alone. Um, and over half of them sent, you know, material for molecular analysis. Now, why do I talk about that? Because this is such a stark contrast. Well, and this table actually just tells you what the ranges of FNA gauge needles and the core biopsy needles were. Um, most commonly, 20 gauge needle was being used for core biopsies. FNAs, I think most commonly 22 gauge was being used. And most people use coaxial technique, um, as you could tell, over the half at least. Um, and both, it didn't matter whether they were doing FNA or core, most people performed at least you know, three or more passes. Um, the pneumothorax risk um, you know, during that study um, you know, really um, you know, was not any different um, between the FNA um, or core biopsy. Um, and uh, so in most of the time, at least, uh, um, the people performing the core needle biopsy used conscious sedation at, at least half the time. Um, this was in a stark contrast to 20, 2005, um, where most people actually were only performing fine needle aspirin. So in, in 10 years, you see that people, a third of the people were um, performing core needle biopsy, whereas 85% you know, of the people were performing core needle biopsy in 2015. Um, and you see different practice patterns emerge too, where uh, not many were using conscious sedation in the past. And this, of course, depends on practice parameters. Obviously, Dr. Bernstein was talking about the outpatient setting. Uh, I would imagine, you know, a lot of people were not using conscious sedation in outpatient setting. And that was the case when we performed it in, in an office-based lab, um, as opposed to in the hospital, you know, we're always using conscious sedation, um, you know, especially given patient preference for that. Um, so that, you know, uh, is a significant trend. Um, in the, in the, over the past 10 years. Um, and in terms of uh, u using CT, um, you know, not significantly different, but a little higher in 2015. Um, so, you know, basically, you, there are, the attendees, I think, is, are a wide range um, um, from both uh, technologists to um, guys early out in their career, perf people performing in the outpatient setting, inpatient settings. Um, as well as um, some um, people um, in training. So, you know, we, we all know the different types of uh, FNA needles um, and, uh, you know, people have preference for different kinds in whatever's on the shelf. Um, you know, ours were mainly Francine and Westcott's when we used to do them. Um, the core biopsy needles, um, actually this becomes, um, you know, pretty good topic to talk about because depending on where you practice, um, in an in institution may have, you know, one type of core biopsy needle. So it, it is, uh, you know, a point of contention between partners and what type of core biopsy needles, uh, you know, are being used. Um, uh, initially, when me and uh, my partner started looking into it, they were comfortable using um, the side cut. Um, so what are the side cut needles? The true cut and the Temno are usually the side cut needles. Um, and uh, uh, I was using the full cylindrical core, which is the biopins, and uh, a couple other companies make the full cylindrical cores. But um, the reason this came about is because our pathologists preferred, you know, not to pat yourself on the back, but preferred the full cylindrical cores um, because it's less fragmented. And uh, this actually came up on one of our IR forums today, as a matter of fact, uh, in terms of uh, how to get better 
force because we're in the era of molecular uh, testing when you need more sample, um, you know, more tissue. So if you, if you can give anyone a less fragmented core, um, you know, obviously it would get you more tissue for molecular imaging testing. So um, in a, you know, <clears throat> recent study at, uh, that the Beaumont guys actually published, um, uh, FNA, um, you know, had a relatively high sensitivity when done properly, you know, 80 to uh, 99% and, uh, you know, pretty good specificity. And however, um, in when you're looking for accuracy in diagnosing malignancy, there's a wide range from 60 to 97%. But, um, you know, if you're looking to diagnose a benign diagnosis in a FNA, that was much less. Um, however, when you, you know, get a core biopsy, a definitive benign diagnosis was increased, you know, uh, twofold. Um, so, um, you know, this is not just because of home run, you know, slam dunk, uh, you know, pet positive lesions that you need to core, but, you know, also lesions that you're not unsure about. Um, core biopsies will definitely get you better yield in terms of being able to diagnose uh, benign etiologies. Um, so, again, you know, we're talking about lymphoproliferative disorders or even I, send, I quite often send things that are, um, you know, equivocal for microbiology testing. So, you know, there you would want to have core, um, you know, samples. So um, here are the different types of core biopsies. We're talking about the cylindrical cores, which is the biopins in the left side, the temno, um, you know, most often we're uh, always using the uh, coaxial needle. Um, and uh, there are sometimes, you know, with the evolution that uh, some institutions may not have the core biopsies, I would always suggest using the coaxial technique. You're not, you don't want to traverse the pleura, you know, more than you want to. Once your coaxial um, introducer needle is there, you wouldn't have to traverse the uh, pleura um, any more than you need to. Um, so I think Dr. Bernstein, um, you know, went, uh, went over the techniques uh, really well in terms of angling the gantry, angling the patient, um, and you know, directing, um, you know, using your anatomy to direct. Uh, um, your approach to the lesion, uh, whether placing the patient prone, supine, oblique, um, you know, or in the lateral decubitus positions to get you the best access route to the needle. Um, and, uh, you know, all of us can either use uh, the marking grids, which is what uh, I, you know, definitely use in my practice, um, or you can use BB markers or um, anything, you know, metallic objects to basically guide your uh, skin entry site and then uh, your access trajectory. Um, a few, you know, other, um, you know, things, you know, that uh, I will kind of, in the interest of time, gloss over, but, uh, you know, mention specifically are, um, you know, your pleural-based lesions, you want to, you know, avoid directly, you know, accessing the pleural-based lesions. If you can get an oblique trajectory uh, towards the pleural-based lesions and through, um, that way you have less risk of pneumothorax. So you don't want to basically, you know, direct the needle straight at it, you know, if you can come in at a different angle um, so that um, you're traversing some parenchyma and you know, before getting to the pleural base lesion, that would actually avoid you um, getting a pneumothorax. Um, so relative contraindication. So as Dr. Bernstein was saying, since I am in a hospital setting, you know, I take on lesions, you know, nowadays we're taking on like five millimeters to nine millimeter lesions, you know, because that's what, you know, uh, people are asking you to do, you know, some of these can be PET positive, you know, although, you know, you're not seeing a PET positive five millimeter lesion, but there are lesions, you know, in, when you're looking at treatment response or metastatic lesions that even though they're small, um, you know, your skill set may be at, at test, but uh, you know, more so that we are practicing in the hospital settings, we are doing smaller lesions. And therefore your, you know, complication rate may increase um, in, in that setting. Um, in terms of your pneumothoraces. But if you have a certain, you know, protocol-based guideline approach, um, your complication rate stays pretty much the same. And it doesn't really vary between FNA or core biopsies. So I don't think people should be shying away from core biopsies because if you're going to put a patient through a procedure, you know, you should get the result. Um, so, uh, and you should get the yield for it. Um, and if you're practicing in a hospital-based setting, um, you could watch them, you know, for post-procedural pneumothoraces. And if you need to, you know, you can put in a chest tube very easily. So um, here are a few relative contraindications. You know, obviously we know uh, all about uncooperative patients. You can't get them, you know, sedated and be cooperative. You know, don't do it. Um, positive pressure ventilation, I would, 
you know, do my best to avoid that if the patient's, you know, ventilated, um, severe respiratory compromise. That's a relative, you know, I've had, you know, plenty of patients that have, you know, performed biopsies on that have had respiratory compromise. You, you talk to them ahead of time, you know, if they have a severe emphysema, you know, you have a high rate of pneumothorax and tell them that you're probably going to get a chest tube. Uh, you may have an air leak necessitating chest tube to stay in longer. So these are all conversations to be had before. Um, and, uh, you know, if you tell them ahead of time, you know, they do pretty well. Um, and, the, and we know about the other uh, relative contraindications, including PAH and uh, interstitial lung disease. Small lesions close to the diaphragm. If you take an oblique approach, you should be okay, you know, biopsying these. And we've done, you know, plenty of these in our practice. So just to give you a number, um, I personally do like close to 200 or more uh, biopsies a year. So I have two other partners. So we're pretty, you know, fairly large practice doing these. Um, central lesions adjacent to large vessels or bronchi. Um, Dr. Bernstein showed you a, a good um, case, you know, next to the aorta. Um, this, just this week, I've had at least three. Um, and of, of course, we all have our preferences in terms of which staff we want in those cases because, you know, probably, you know, tight anal sphincter when you're biopsying right next to the aorta. Um, but if you have a good nurse, you know, um, that's you see, you know, used to um, you performing search cases and you know your throw is exactly, you know, where you measure it to, like a like two centimeter throw or 1.3 centimeter throw, um, then you should be fairly confident in biopsying these central lesions. Um, adjacent to bronchi or adjacent to bronchioles, yes, do tell them about your risk of, um, you know, hemoptysis or you know, self-limited hemoptysis, I'll say, you know, yeah, they're gonna spit up a little bit of blood, um, but it's nothing, you know, massive or life-threatening. Um, so do tell them about it, do know about it, um, and be prepared for it. Um, and uh, I think, you know, especially when doing it in a hospital setting, it's very safely done. Um, so I think, you know, all of us know about, you know, what we want for our platelet counts and INRs you know, over, 50 and 1.5, um, you know, we, uh, in certain patients, we, you know, sometimes forego those rules, but uh, we try to stick to that most uh, often. Um, so um, this comes up quite often, especially from referring physicians. So I think, you know, having a certain standard set is, um, should always help you with your referring physicians and patients because your coordinators are actually making those phone calls. You know, they're telling the patients to, hold their plavixes and aspirins and that kind of thing. We don't uh, see the need to hold aspirin at all. So we don't want to confuse the patients. We never hold our aspirin uh, in lung biopsies and we have yet to have any major complication uh, from that. Plavix we do hold for five days. Lovenox we do, you know, hold the last dose. And uh, newer DOACs and NOACs, um, you know, basically the Eliquis and Zeraltos two to three days before and, and uh, you know, and the primary should know most of that. So, um, you know, angling the gantry, angling the patient, and taking an approach. I think Dr. Bernstein had um, talked, you know, quite well about it. Patient uh, position the patient, you know, decubitus if you need to, um, avoiding fissures, uh, and most importantly, um, you know, to avoid pneumothorax are you know key points. Um, and uh, <clears throat> important factors we had already talked about: avoiding chest wall vessels. You know, when people. You may want to give contrast if you think you can't see an internal mammary artery, but if you're going, you know, straight down, um, you know, close to the medial uh, portions. Um, intercostal arteries, um, haven't seen too much of that, although uh, I have to say I did get post biopsy from outside institutions where I've, I've had to embolize intercostal arteries. Um, so just be aware of it um, and minimize pleural transgression. So there, that's uh, the topic about using an introducer needle. Uh, and avoiding large ballet. Um, these are all things that, you know, you know, people develop in their own practice and they see in their fellowships that they should uh, know well about before getting out and doing these kind of things. Um, the, <clears throat> the one thing about avoiding, um, you know, the uh, central necrotic component, I think um, that's lost on a lot of uh, practitioners because you know, they blame the pathologist. We do have on-site uh, pathologists, um, you know, because we're not in an OBL setting and I do have them come, you know, pretty much all the time. Um, and uh, I will say that, you know, my diagnostic yield is over, you know, 90, 90 to 95%, um, even in smaller lesions, less than 1.5 centimeters. 
And the reason for that is I do get coarse. Um, and you know, it's, it's, it's easy to complain that pathologists are not seeing something when you're not giving them enough tissue. Um, so uh, avoid the central necrotic component. And if you do have a central necrotic component, as Dr. Bernstein was saying, you can adjust the needle. Uh, towards the you know the larger solid component or peripheral solid component. Um, if you're planning your CT, um, do it ahead of time so that you're um, aiming your needle towards the solid component. If it's in the periphery or if it's in the medial aspect, wherever it is, um, you direct it toward that. Um, and um, you know another point is if your lesions are less than a centimeter and a half and you're biopsying tiny lesions. It may be hard to, you know, push the coaxial introducer needle all the way into um, um, the actual lesion because that may be the actual entire lesion. So sometimes I do leave it, you know, right out of side of lesion, so my throw actually goes through the lesion. Um, although, you know, depending on where you are, it may push things away. But uh, you can actually do a pre and post procedure or um, post throw um, CT, um, and you can see if your throw had gone through. Um, you know, I don't really make a real big point about, you know, throwing it like the Temno needle and then, you know, doing a CT. I think that's just way too cumbersome. And people that got used to doing that, I don't know why you do it. Um, because with the, bi with the biopens needle, once the coaxial needle is there and the trajectory is there, that's where it's going through. Um, so, you know, don't get all fancy and, you know, put the, the gun in and then take a CT. I think that's just um, overkill and asking for complications. Um, and, uh, and we had talked about our path, you know, towards, uh, floral lesions. Um, and, uh, here's usually what, what I do. I leave it at the edge of the lesion and, you know, if it's a small lesion and then, you know, take a trajectory through it and you know that that's, you got a good sample through that and you'll, you'll have actual tissue core you're seeing. And, um, so, uh, finishing up, you know, what do people do? I know, I think this is kind of, uh, you know, you know, free for all, you know, I've used a biocentric plug and autologous clot, um, you know, I'll leave it up to our participants to kind of, um, you know, chat about it and, uh, and let me know as well. Um, I, I kind of backed away from using the biocentric plug. Um, you know, I personally have not seen a, a lot of benefit from it because I use autologous clot now and it works just as fine for me. Um, so we just take a little bit of patient's blood, you know, just before I start the procedure you know, leave it on the table, and then I just inject the autologous clot through the introducer needle, and it, it works well to seal off uh, the pleural tract, um, as long as you know where your pleural um, site is because you've measured it before. Um, so, um, you know, in, even in uh, um, our, the pneumothorax rate requiring chest tube placements is widely varied, um, you know, unlike Dr. Um, Bernstein's, um, you know, OBL setting, because we are biopsying, you know, a range of uh, lesions, you know, even smaller than a centimeter. Um, but um, we have not seen any higher pneumothorax rates, you know, with uh, 18 gauge versus 20 gauge um, or FNA versus uh, core. So I think, you know, if you can get the tissue and get it safely, do it that way. Um, so there's just a little table, um, you know, on, uh, um, you know, the, the uh, pneumothorax rate. Right? And, and it's very variable, you know, obviously the size and lesion depth always influence that. Um, so, you know, you can't take, you know, a 1% pneumothorax rate in a certain setting that's always going to biopsy lesions about a five centimeters. You know, anyone can throw a needle, you know, at it from, you know, far away into that. Um, so, and we're talking about inexperienced or experienced radiologists doing this, or if the patient has emphysema, obviously your, you know, pneumothorax rates, you know, it's all about patient selection and that's going to, you know, influence, you know, what your um, uh, complication rates are going to be too. Um, so what's new now and why are we even talking about this non-sexy topic, I guess, um, because it is very pertinent in this era. Um, so FNA versus court, you know, we have shown many studies that have proven the efficacy of core over FNA. Um, now we're coming down to 18 versus 20 gauge. Um, so there are, there have been a handful of studies out in Asia, Dr. Bernstein studies, and, you know, the guys over at Beaumont that have looked into some of this stuff, um, that 18 gauge, you know, core biopsy versus 20 gauge, there is no increased risk of any complication. So this has been shown in studies. So, you know, you can take that from the horse's mouth or you can actually, you know, adapt it at your own as a QA project at your own institution. Um, 
and full core versus side notch, it's pretty, you know, self-intuitive, fragmented versus full cylindrical core. Our pathologists attested that. But um, I will say that we are doing an ongoing study at our own institution to get five-year data. So um, at least, you know, at that point, uh, you can believe that I'm just not talking out of my, you know what. Um, so um, this is just uh, another study just showing that had a, you know, big range of 550 patients, um, you know, anywhere between 30 to, you know, uh, over 90 years. They used both an 18 and a 20 gauge needle. So uh, take home point in that, no significant difference in pneumothorax rate between the 18 and 20 gauge needle. Uh, diagnostic accuracy, very similar. Uh, chest tube insertion rate, no significant difference. So, um, you know, this was actually a you know, fairly large, you know, N number. Um, so, you know, if people wanna, um, and this came up during our um, IR forums that we have in terms of questions about different types of needles and do, is there any studies or is it subjective? Until now, it was subjective, you know, but if there's studies out there and you wanna take it to the bank, here it is. Um, so we talked about the, you know, cytologic yield. This is pretty self-intuitive, but, you know, here it is that, uh, um, that the 18 gauge needle, um, you know, yielded a good uh, diagnostic cytology with fewer passers. So um, we're talking about full core versus side notch devices. Um, here, I think both Dr. Bernstein and I are talking about the, you know, the biopens because it's a full core cylindrical specimen. What, I mean, the advantage of that is very, um, you know, uh, intuitive to the pathologist because they're seeing non-fragmented full core samples that they can actually, you know, um, get better yield, you know, when they put under the microscope. So, and also you, they can send it away for molecular testing. So we don't do molecular imaging testing ourselves. We send it to Mayo, obviously, you, you know, more tissue, the better. So here, what, Here's what it looks like in a cartoon diagram, obviously, um, and our experience uh, currently um, is very similar to the uh, Beaumont Hospital data in terms of uh, 18 versus 20 gauge, and then uh, our five-year data is still pending. Um, so here's some of our references, and I think we've talked, and most of these references that I've included in the slides in terms of their study data. Um, and uh, that's about it. Thank you. Great, thank you. So at this point, I'm going to open it up for questions. Um, I believe we have a few in the chat, so I'm gonna read these first, Dr. Bernstein and Dr. Kukarla, and then um, if we have any additional questions, please submit them in the chat. So the first question is, do you use coaxial technique for all of your biopsies? How many specimens do you obtain on average for each biopsy? Rob, you want to take that or? I, yeah, right. so uh, for the lung biopsies, yeah, coaxial for every, uh, every, every patient, uh, like Dr. Kakarla was saying, you, you don't want to be going in and out of the lung multiple times. So the coaxial allows you to go in once into the mass. And then through that, uh, depending on the size of the mass, a uh, minimum of two, uh, sometimes three or four, depending on uh, what it looks like when it comes out, but usually you can get plenty of tissue with just two passes through the, at least in my, in my experience in my office here, we get enough tissue for the molecular analysis with two passes with a, you know, the 1.3 centimeter throw. Does yeah. That work and, well? Yep. And so I, yeah, I use coaxial technique in every single case and that's exactly, you know, why. Um, and I usually, I don't know why I come up with this number, but I take three samples because you know, if, if they want to send it away to molecular imaging or something somewhere else, they can. Um, so yeah, no, I usually take about three core samples and I use coaxial technique every time. Yeah, I like three as well. Just to, if the lesion's smaller, then I, I get a little nervous and I want to be yeah. in that quicker. That's all. Great. The next question is, when do you send patients to get chest tubes if you get a pneumothorax? 20% question mark or only when patients is symptomatic. How do you follow these patients up? So I, I think like it's probably different in the uh, OBL setting and ours. Um, I'll, I'll just like, you know, say in our setting, um, we do a 
post procedural x ray at one and two hours. Um, and then, so if it's growing, if, I mean, we have less than a 20% pneumothorax and it's not growing at two hours and they're asymptomatic and they're doing fine. I don't. Um, and if, in the, if in fact it's growing, um, then we, you know, get another x ray, you know, a couple hours later. And we, if they're asymptomatic, that is. And if it's growing at that time, then we put it in. Um, if they are symptomatic in that two hours um, and it has grown, you know, over 20, if it's bigger than 20%, then we put it in. But it's, yeah, it's, it's, you treat the patient, not the picture. Yeah. Great. Next question. Do you feel the larger core specimens allow you to get away with less passes than a standard side notch style needle? Oh, absolutely. 100%. Yep. Easy as that. Go back to Dr. Bernstein's first slide. Yes. <laughs> okay, and then I believe we have um, two more. In the outpatient study, was there any predictors of complications identified? Um, so we did look at that, and I, I think I may have uh, forgot to mention with the statistical analysis with looking at mass volume, uh, distance from the pleura, age of the patient, and really the only thing we found was that uh, the farther away from the pleura you are, the more likely you're going to drop the lung. It didn't have anything to do with the various sizes. Even some of the small ones right up against the lung or deeper in, that didn't change the numbers at all. It was just really how far, how much lung you have to transgress to get to the lesion. You're, the deeper you go, the more likely you are to get a pneumo. Um, and that was really about it. Is that your experience as well in the inpatient? Yeah, no, I, that's the same experience we have as inpatient, yeah. Um, and I'm, obviously we're taking smaller, um, you know, lesions. Um, so yes, you know, in the smaller lesions, you know, we, and the deeper you go, we're getting, you know, higher complication rates. But yeah, I would say that's the biggest predictor. Okay, last question. Yeah, go ahead. I know you mentioned the COPD. I, Sometimes I notice that the stiffer lungs tend to shrink less when they, because uh, uh, they, they're less elastic, so they don't get as big. The pneumos that I've seen on those uh, that I was expecting to have, just the whole lung collapse, they just, they stay open because the lung is so rigid. I don't know if you've seen that as well. Um, y yes and no. I mean, I think, you know, the, the guys we see with uh, severe COPD also have, um, you know, some other um, concomitant interstitial lung diseases. So, yeah, the ones with just COPD, yes, I, I agree. I think that's what we kind of, you know, noticed too. Uh, the ones with concomitant interstitial lung diseases or fibrosis um, tend to do worse. You know, I, I, yeah, I do see those people actually have like air leaks, you know, when for a while when I put those chest tubes in actually. Um, and it takes a couple of days, you know, until the air leak resolves and we're down to water seal and that kind of thing and you get the chest tube out. Thank you. And I believe we have one last question. What breathing instructions do you give prior to biopsy? And does this differ with the size and depth of the lesion? Well, for me, with, with my patients who are all awake and we're talking the whole time, I just tell them that it's important to me that they keep breathing um, and I just have them to breathe normal, um, mostly because if they stop breathing, I have to do a lot of paperwork and I hate doing paperwork. Yeah, no, I, I agree. I mean, I, I think Dr. Bernstein I already mentioned this, you know, in his talk, like in terms of, you know, breath hold techniques and stuff, everyone's so varied in their breath hold techniques. And then exactly, and I, th I don't think it's very reproducible. Um, so if, if, if you have a lesion in the apex or have a lesion near, you know, the claustrophrenic angle where you think like, oh, it's a small lesion, it's going to move quite a bit. Um, then I actually, you know, do a couple of scans ahead of time and see, if this thing is going to be, you know, targeted very easily, or is this like all over the place? Um, so at that point, then that's what I use, you know, depending on the patient, because if you have a, you know, frail old lady, you know, who's hard, hard of hearing and she's not going to hold the breath hold for you when you're out of the room, that's not going to work for you. Um, or if you have a young person in, in their thirties, they're going to do the same instruction every time. Yeah, that may work in a small lesion that's that's moving along, you know. So I think it's all—it's a very you know subjective thing. Um, but I tend not to give them any breathing. So I tell them to breathe normally. That like um, you know, like Rob said, yeah. Great. Okay, we have two more questions. <laughs> 
Are any of you doing lung ablation? Has your availability to perform these successful biopsies increased your practice volume? Yeah, we are. Um, so, I mean, uh, obviously, because I'm in the inpatient setting, and I, I, I don't know if Rob's doing these in the outpatient setting as well, um, but we, we are doing lung ablation. And yes, it has, because, um, and I'll tell you the reason why is, I was in a practice before where we, where we had st um, started a lung tumor conference. So that will aid you um, along with your tumor boards that you go to in an inpatient setting. Because if you have a dedicated lung tumor conference, um, then a primary care can directly refer that you know, to whoever the coordinator is to that lung tumor conference. Let's say, hey, I have this patient. Would you guys talk about him you know, on your Tuesday afternoon uh, lung tumor board? And then that's usually the, you know, the IR doc and the pulmonologist and um, maybe the CT surgeon and the oncologist. And you can talk about, you know, whatever nodule you want to. And at that point, you have all the people there. If the guy has poor PFTs or, you know, poor pulmonary function, that's your lung ablation right there. And you, you have all the people to agree with you to do that lung ablation too. And because you're like, well, I'll put a needle in it, but I'm going to burn it, you know, because this person's not going to have great pulmonary reserve anyway. So you do it at the same time. And we usually have our pathologist right there. So I'm able to get, you know, on-site um, specimen adequacy confirmation. You, of course, the final diagnosis may come back later, but if they're like, yeah, this looks like atypical cells, I'm burning it, you know, so, or, or I'm freezing it, you know, but we do lung ablation. And yes, it, uh, it, this has increased our ability, especially when we're able to do um, core biopsies on um, patients, um, and that were probably deemed difficult samplings. Um, and if they have poor pulmonary reserve, um, yes, it does say, you know, BOTUS to say, if I'm gonna put a needle in that thing, I'm gonna, you know, try to kill that thing. You know, we don't do that in the outpatient setting, so. But that's, that's, that sounds like a great way to do it. Last question. How long do you observe patients post lung biopsy? So in my office, we keep them an hour. Um, uh, I've, we found if we keep them longer, it doesn't change anything. Um, so I tell the patients, plan on being here about two hours. Uh, you're gonna have about a, ha a half an hour of filling out paperwork, talking about the procedure, half hour for the procedure, half another hour of observation, and then off you go. Yeah, I think um, so. It's a we have three partners. So um, I we well the, routinely we keep them two hours. Um, if there is nothing, if it's uh, run of the mill, and the first X-ray at that one hour looks good, I send them home in an hour. Personally, um, my partners I think still keep them about a couple of hours, two hours. Okay, thank you. I believe that was the last question. So before we start, uh, I, I talk about our next webinar. I, on behalf of Argonne Medical, thank you everyone for joining today. And a special thank you to Dr. Bernstein and Dr. Kukarla uh, for your insight and clinical experience with uh, full core biopsies specifically in the lung. So thank you again. So I also wanted to just talk about our next webinar. Um, up next, we will be focused on the TIPS procedure. If you have not already done so, please follow us on LinkedIn and Twitter um, for additional details on our next ACEs webinar. You should see those in the uh, coming weeks. So again, thank you all for your participation and have a great evening. Have a great day. Thank you.